Working with the new cosmology, you often feel like you're a very small voice in a very noisy world that is telling us exactly the opposite of who we are and, and who we can be. Just to be is a blessing, just to live is holy. And these were two shells that were found on the beach in um, uh, Plum Island in, in Massachusetts. And this is the image of every morning when I would go out to pray um, while I was living on the farm and remember um, that I live within the energies of the cosmos. This is uh, an image of my experience of being so loved um, as part of this creation. The divine becomes so intimate as we begin to realize how deeply we're embedded in this of the earth. Isn't it a wonderful thing that there are mornings? Uh, I rise each day with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving. This is back to the summer of 1988 and uh, I began with my own exhaustion after taking care of my mom and telling the story, uh, knowing of what's happening to our earth so we have the darkness, the night here. And what began to appear as I was working with this image were all kinds of images of spirit and hand, the creative hand of God and the healing hand of God. And this dead tree sprouts new life, you know, that winter turns into spring. And that whole cycle of suffering, um, mystery of suffering, giving way to um, new life became a very hopeful image. I found this deer skull and it was so beautiful. And then as I began to draw it, I was just drawing it at the time I was taking care of my mom and these flowers began to appear. Messages from another form of beauty. Um, that there is, a, there is a beauty in death. Uh, the wisdom of the elders, um, what wisdom we all carry within us, and especially our elders who have lived long lives. This is Thomas Berry, uh, who has been such a mentor for so many, and who has given so many of us hope and courage to keep going. This was my mom, who had just died that year, a Native American, um, Chief Joseph who said, no more war, no more war, we will no more fight, and tried to escape into Canada, and his people were caught before they could do that and, and herded back to the U.S. Um, an African, um, African American, uh, a white hill person, uh, probably someone who came from Europe and lives in the mountains, and then the Eastern traditions symbolized there. Um, this was at the first location of Spirit Earth, and it was the driveway. And mo one morning I went out and saw this. It was a misty morning and the maple trees that lined the driveway. Um, the radiance of our creation um, is magnificent. This was uh, a tree. I was in an ashram for a couple, a few months in the middle of winter, and this tree was outside of the prayer hall. And I would look at it through the window, and before you knew it, I was that tree dancing, <laughs> dancing into, uh, dancing with the cosmic wonders that were just outside. The stars, I had never seen stars like that. It was up in northern Wisconsin. This is a celebration of the fire at the heart of the earth and how our earth is so alive because it has this fiery core and uh, the crust keeps uh, itself alive. The life within and the life outside, just like with, uh, with we humans, that we have this rich inner life and, and then our 
beautiful exterior life, that's true of the earth too. Um, and probably true in us because it's true of the earth. Our, uh, again, our contemplative dimension of experiencing ourselves as companion. The rocks are our most ancient ancestors. I'm totally fascinated by rocks. And especially, I mean, I think humans always have been because some of the oldest uh, records we have of, of human, what, religion are the circles of stone and all over the world, um, the, the rocks, our ancestors. And then um, this one is so interesting. <laughs> You know, sometimes you start drawing something and you don't know what's going to show up. This was one of those. But um, the experience I had of lying on the ground and how life-giving that is. There's a whole um, method of healing that has been, uh, that actually someone who is on, uh, on his way till death discovered just by lying on the earth and then what began to happen. So healing. This was what it's uh, kind of like what it's like to stand in the redwoods. Uh, there was an ancient redwood forest that I spent time in three or four or five times when I was in California for a visit. And um, the poet David White recently asked the question when I was in the Connemara Mountains with a group that he was guiding there. Why is it that we're, when we're in the presence of the natural world, we almost all at once feel at peace, we feel whole again, we feel integrated, we feel um, that uh, there, there's something that begins to happen within, our inner life comes alive. And he said, I've begun to think it's because everything in the natural world is being exactly what it's meant to be. It's not concerned that it's not something else, or bigger, or smaller, or anything like that. It, it just is what it is. And it's only we who try to strive beyond. Um, oh, we're always living for the future, in a sense, unable to live uh, the beauty of the present moment and the fullness of the present moment. And it's interesting to me now, today, how much of the philosophy is bringing us back to the present moment. How important is the now? How many books we have uh, showing up with that? This is a fireball. I mean, how do you picture a fireball? This one is a pretty quiet fireball. But it's the intensity of the light and energy coming from the center. And behind here, is actually a face, and it was, it was, um, I had to have the, the presence that existed before the fireball. Uh, the sense of that out of the divine, um, this, this love, this energy, this light overflowed. Okay, so that was the image, that was chapter one, the fireball. And then when the universe changed shape and this tremendous energy and the particles of matter were spread out and cooled enough to hold together. And uh, this was the image that came to me of how atoms began to form and what we now call matter uh, began. So that was the universe changing shape. And then we have, um, these clouds of atoms at some point began to ignite uh, into stars and become uh, dancing galaxies of stars. And it's out of the, um, the supernova that was our ancestor, the ancestor of our solar system, that all of us come. And so that's why I put the little human here, that we're made of the stardust. We're made of the, star, uh, the dust of, a, of an old star that died and gave birth to a new generation star, our sun. And that all the atoms, all the elements that are in our bodies, all the um, 
iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, the phosphorus, the magnesium, and all the elements that are in the plants and animals were created in that supernova explosion. That is so exciting. And one of our interns, I did this while well, I was at, one, uh, at Spirit Earth, one of our interns went home one night to tell her little four-year-old son who was in preschool what she had learned that day. I mean, he, he told her and then she told him. And I learned something today too. And she said that we're all made of stardust. And he said, oh, mom, I already knew that. <laughs> So the children are learning it, which is mar marvelous. So, and then in our solar system, all the planets that e evolve around, revolve around the sun, there's only one in the solar system where the conditions and the gravity and the distance from the sun and the size, everything was just right so that life came forth. So this is the... Um, this is a, another moment of grace in the great story. And then this moment of grace was simply how um, eventually out of the seas came uh, dry land. And I think I was thinking of one of my favorite um, images that Brian Swim has in, in the Canticle to the Cosmos of how the the mountains emerged and danced across, <laughs> uh, danced across the land. So how we as a planet now have dry land and then how the, the plant life and the animal life began to emerge from the oceans so that um, Earth began to change again. And then this is the wonderful story that I love in Lauren Isley of how flowers change the world and um, evolution, how evolution took off in the last, like the beautiful Cenozoic age um, that we live in. And that into this uh, whirling and dancing and colorful uh, web of life emerged, um, or out of this emerged the human. And I think this is autobiographical as well as like, I love to imagine what the first humans felt as they looked around and wondered at all they saw. And I think this is happening for me right now in my own life as I recognize more and more easily the beauty and the divinity that's at the heart of all creation. Um, the eyes of wonder <laughs> and awe. And then this tells the story of how for most of our lives we were hunters and gatherers and we moved with the seasons lightly across the land and we learn the secrets in every leaf and tree, the healing secrets. And, but then we began to shape, um, to shape the land uh, in a way to our image as we began to settle down uh, and do agriculture and to live in villages and then in larger uh, groupings and cities and then we have the beginning of um, what we call civilization, um, the dynasties, the um, kingdoms, and so on, the empires. Uh, and they all have uh, a similar, they all have similar characteristics, and that is of, <clears throat> of a kind of, um, um, not, not just oppression, it becomes oppressive, but the control, the domination, um, the colonization of those that are different from us, all of those things that now we call patriarchy. And I use this uh, chambered nautilus as an image of how we are part of this unfolding universe and that it's, this is just so recent that we have organized ourselves in this way of patriarchy. And then this is the bad news and the good news of our present moment. This is the bad news of how we are, uh, we are polluting and toxifying our earth and destroying its resources and its species and that we, that we are passing this on to our children. So it has a child that is nursing, you might say, at its mother's breast, which is toxic. 
uh, which is just such a, that was just an awful thing for me to draw and paint. It was terrible. It just felt terrible. But that at the same moment that we're discovering this, uh, diff this um, destructive uh, effect that we're having on the planet, that we're also discovering our story, that we live in this magnificent universe that is older and larger and more magnificent than we could have ever imagined and that we carry that whole story within us and that we have the possibility of creating a relationship with Earth which will be mutually enhancing both for the Earth and for ourselves. And that is the, um, the hope that I have. Um, I would probably put this as the final image now, that we are one uh, dancing, beautiful community of life within the earth. And uh, that's, what, that's, what, that's what we could become. Uh, as humans, this is another image, we're just at the edge of greatness, you might say, of the wonderful compassion and love of which humans are capable of. We have begun to learn to love and care and be compassionate beyond our tribe and um, are beginning to be able to embrace the whole of creation. Not just other humans, that of course, but all creation even beyond our own species. <laughs>